Hashem Hashem Nasev V'Natzliach, Shul Torah, Baruch Hashem, we continue our series, Amazing Questions About God, uh, number 17. Uh, today, if you don't mind, speak a little louder. I have ear infections in both of my ears, uh, so it's a lot of fun. Um, but uh, other than that, without Hashem, hopefully Hashem gives us some decent words to say to you guys, so I can do tshuva. And you too. Zat uh, Hashem, today we have Refua Shlema to Rav Ephraim, uh, Ben Shulamit, uh, Levana Bat Sara, Sara Bat Levana, Ovadia Ben Levana, David Ben Esriya, uh, Doris Bat Jora, um, Elisha Bachaya Bat uh, Sara, Miriam Bat Mazal, Baruch Ben Rivka, Zachariah Ben, Anat. And the, the Rabbi Nitz name, what's her name again? Nechama Edo Bat Sara Malka. Kadosh Baruch Hu will give a refuah shlema, refuah the nefesh, refuah the goof. The amount of uh, health crises that are happening today is unbelievable. It seems like uh, we have the best medicine we've ever had, at least most advanced, but yet we have more sick people. Uh, I'm not sure whether we have more sick people or it's just that people are surviving sickness for longer, so it seems like it. Uh, it just seems like there's a lot of sick people. Um, the uh, Torah is very particular about how to treat certain sickness. When to treat it, how to treat it, you can't just go to anyone to treat it. For example, the Gemara in Masechet uh, Avodah Zarah says this is a uh, debate between two Chachamim. One of the Chachamim is sick. But not sick like he has a cold or ear infection. Sick like he's dying. I believe if I remember the story correctly, he was bitten by a snake. And uh, he was dying. And he says to the other, he says, listen, there's such and such has a cure. But he's a uh, idol worshiper. Mean. Meaning he recruits people to his a, uh, idolatry. He's a missionary. Recruits them to Christianity. Recruits them to all types of Abu Dazara. But he's the one that has the cure. Can I just go? I mean, the guy is named in the Gemara, which means that he's able to revive the dead. He's not Chas uh, Shalom uh, going to become a uh, missionary uh, Christian. We're not worried about him. But he tells the Chacham, he goes, listen, can I, do the sages allow me to go get a cure to save my life from this person? He's the one that has a cure. And he tells them, no, you have no permission to go. Achachamim teaches that you're not allowed. We learned from Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkinos, also in the same Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara, that you're not even allowed to be within six feet of a missionary. You're not even allowed to speak to them. If they speak to you, you have to walk away. Not even allowed to entertain their thought. Kal you're not allowed to go there to uh, get them to treat you. Yeah, but this is a pikuach nefesh. Life risk, pikoch nefesh, someone's life risk, you're allowed to drive on Shabbat. Not only allowed to drive on Shabbat, if you drive into a, uh, if you drive into the hospital, it's mitzvah. If uh, a baby, chas v'shalom, is sick, and you need to cook something for it on fire, on Shabbat, it's no questions, it's a mitzvah to make him food. Mitzvah, it's not that it's not a sin, it's a mitzvah. Even if it's with a baby, even if it's only a possibility, because all babies are considered pikuach nefesh. But he tells them, you're an adult, you have no right. Why? It's much more dangerous to take the risk of him stealing your soul than you dying. And he doesn't go and he dies. He dies. Mama says he dies. And you know what he said to him? Ashrecha, that you died listening to the Chachamim. Ashrecha, may you, you're praiseworthy that you died listening to the sages. 
It's not that he brought him back to life. He died. He died. That's no like, oh, it's a better end to the story. or No, that's the story. He died. But praiseworthy are you for listening to the Chachamim. Such is the magnitude of Divrei Chachamim, Rabotai. And that's also such is the magnitude of staying away from such people that steal souls for a living, like missionaries and uh, all types of falsehood that's in the world. But nonetheless, there are certain things in the Torah that uh, you wouldn't think are considered pikuach nefesh, but they are. So a standard toothache, for example, the same Gemara talks about it. Standard toothache is not considered pikuach nefesh. One time I had a student, I think I, t- I told you guys the story, and uh, he stopped coming to Shurim. I told him, how come you stopped coming to Shurim? He said, I did tshuva already. I, I keep Shabbat. I said, yeah, Shabbat is not the only thing we talk about. We talk a little bit more, more than just Shabbat. It's not just a shiur about Shabbat. We talk about a few more things than Shabbat. Because, no, I did tshuva already. I keep Shabbat. You know, kids go to yeshiva. Everything's okay, whatever. A few minutes later, I see him picking up the phone on Shabbat. We're, we're talking, like, walking around, and I see him out, outside. I see him picking up the phone on Shabbat. I thought you said you keep Shabbat. He goes, yeah, it's a, it's a patient. I said, what patient? You're a dentist. He goes, yeah, it's a pikuach nefesh. I'm like, not if it's children. You're a child dentist. You're not even a, uh, you know adult dentist. You take out milk teeth. The teeth are going to come out by themselves anyway. People just want to pay you to expedite the process. You don't learn, you're never going to know. You don't come to Shurim, you're never going to know. But, Rabotai, you should know that there is actually a circumstance where the Chachamim say that toothache can be pikuach nefesh. Can be pikuach nefesh. And the reason why is that it can be uh, an infection. It's not by default, not by default, but it can be a pikuach nefesh if there's certain things that happen. Uh, Rav Mashash, he gave a psak that you're allowed to pull a tooth on Shabbat. Like if you have to remove extract a tooth because the tooth is dead or it's a too infected or whatever the case is, and uh, you or the dentist or both decided that the best thing to do is to pull the tooth. Now pulling a tooth ordinarily is not allowed on Shabbat for multiple reasons. But he says if it's because there's an infection, there's major pain coming from it, you're allowed to do it on Shabbat. And he, that's the psak that he had, Rav Mashash. And he says, and anyone that rules otherwise, anyone that says you're not allowed to pull a tooth on Shabbat regardless, meaning no, it doesn't make a difference. What happened? Just suffer the pain until Moshe Shabbat. Or until Sunday. He says, anyone that judges and give it a psak that you're not allowed to pull a tooth on Shabbat regardless of what happens, clearly never had a toothache. Or never had a toothache on Shabbat. Meaning, Rabotai, that sometimes, sometimes it's critical for us to experience pain in order to know how to rule on Allah, how to judge favorably, how to know what to do in life. Sometimes we have to endure, kaparat avonot, we have to endure a, 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 a certain amount of pain in our life, physically, emotionally, psychologically. Why? So we know how to deal with things in the future. Now the Gemara tells us many times in Masech Brachot that the pain that we have comes for multiple reasons. Sometimes because we made sins, Sometimes because Hashem is trying to elevate us. Sometimes it's to teach us something. Seven reasons I've mentioned in the Gemara. This is one of them, Rabotai. Sometimes we have to actually endure pain so we know what we're dealing with. Sometimes we have to endure pain so we know how to deal with it. You need something? Saf? Huh? You have something? What? You, you need something? You have a question? No, no, I was just looking at the question. Oh, upset. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She, yeah, she just gets involved in a shield. She gives. So, the 
issue of teeth is a very, very sensitive issue because it's almost the worst possible pain there is. When you have a toothache, you can't think straight, you can't see straight, you can't do nothing straight. Toothache is a nightmare and also creates other pains like a, uh, ear infections and gum infections. But we have several stories in the Torah about teeth. But how the Chachamim had this certain type of uh, uh, illness called Tzavdina. Tzafidna, Tzafidna, Tzafidna. In the Gemara Masechet Yoma, page 84a, it says a story about Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan had a Tzafidna. So what's Tzafidna? Rashi says it's an infection of the tooth and the gums. But it's so dangerous that it eventually gets to the stomach. And a person can die from it. So here in the Gemara, it says, obviously, this is something that's, you know, a toothache is, uh, is a big deal. So he went to a doctor, which happened to be a female doctor, not Jewish. And she gave him a cure, but the cure only worked for the day. So the next day he came back. And she gave him a cure again, but only worked for the day. After that, he said, okay, what am I going to do with Shabbat? I mean, if I don't have this cure that you're giving me, uh, I'm suffering immensely. I need, I need something. And it says, one day, one day, one day. What am I going to do about Shabbat? She says, I'll tell you if you promise to never tell anybody else. Cause that's my living. That's how I make my money. People come back. I give them the cure for the day. It's good business. You have a toothache. It's not even your fault. And uh, you come back to her for life says, I tell you the cure for Shabbat, but you have to come back. You have to, uh, can't tell nobody. He says, the Gemara says, I swear to never tell it to Hashem. I'm never going to tell Hashem anything he doesn't know. I swear. And that Shabbat, he dafka did a shiur and a bekneset, telling everybody about the cure. So now the Gemara asks, wait a minute. Didn't he swear? He said, no, look what he swore. He swore not to tell Hashem. Hashem knows everything. Why is to tell Hashem? He's not telling Hashem anything. Oh, but are we concerned about Chilul Hashem? He said no. He did yes. You know, he, uh, he promised. He says the Psak was, the rule that he made, is that he was not worried that the issue of Chilul Hashem will be an issue here at all because he knew personally the magnitude of a pain from a toothache. Meaning, it's not because we're not worried of what people think or don't think. It's because we're worried of what people think or don't think and because we realize that everyone's going to be worried a lot more about a toothache than about what some, uh, some non-Jewish woman that's trying to torture us is, uh, is thinking. We're not worried about saying, oh, he promised not to tell anybody. No, they're going to say, thank you very much, Kfod Arab, you saved all of our lives. We all have two things. Meaning that sometimes the Chachamim had to go to endure pain in order for them to know how to judge. Can you imagine that? One day you wake up with a, uh, you wake up with a headache, you wake up with a backache, you wake up with some type of headache. You have no idea what's going on in your life. But in reality, Hashem is giving you this pain. Why? I want to teach you something. Why teach me? You can't just send me a text message. You can't just send me an email. Hashem, we're in the modern age. No, Hashem, just send an email. It's free. It's free. I don't have to spend money going to a doctor. I know and if, I, if, if I have this pain, I can't learn. I can't write. I can't hear. I can't eat. I can't this. I can't this. I can't, 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 can't. He goes, no. I'm going to show you you can with the pain. Why? That's the lesson. That's the lesson. You can't even with the pain. Now, when Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai, Rabbi Eliezer's son was Kodesh Kodeshim, and each night he would bring, he would say, come back my dear friends. 
What's come back, my dear friends? He would bring infections on his entire body. His entire body, he would be perfectly healthy. But then at night, he'd bring suffering onto himself. Come, my, he'd call them my friends. And infections would, would appear all over his body to the point they had to change the sheets to his house, to his bed, every night 60 times. 60 times, that's how much blood would be filled. Eventually, his wife told, found out that he's doing it to himself. And it's not just uh, he's a poor guy who uh, just happens to be sick. He's doing it to himself. He says, ah, you're doing it to yourself. I've wasted all of my inheritance on you on buying all these uh, bed sheets. If you don't stop, I'm leaving. He says, you can leave. Why? This is what Hashem wants me to do. Why is one treasure? That's how you purify the body. You don't purify the body by going to uh, Minyan. Pray three times a day. It's good. It's good for the soul. Chazaku Baru. Very good. It doesn't purify the body yet. You don't purify the body because uh, you learn Daf Yomi. It's good. Chazaku Baru. It doesn't purify the body though. It's good. You don't purify the body saying Shema Yisrael. Shema Yisrael is good. Mitzvah. Deoraita. It doesn't purify the body. How do you get to a point of being like Moshe Rabbeinu when at the end of his day, 120 years, 120 years, Malach HaMavid arrives, needs to take off his neshama. Moshe Rabbeinu looks at him, scares him away. Get out of here. He runs after him. Malach HaMavid runs away. Malach HaMavid runs away from Moshe Rabbeinu. Scared to death of him. Then then Hashem says, No, Moshe, you got to come up. No, 120 years, I promise. That's it, finished. You can't go to Eretz Israel. The body of Moshe tells Hashem, Hashem, come on. Where else can I find, the Neshama tells the, uh, the Hashem, where else can I find a body like this? That is mamash pure to such an extent, it's the same thing as the Neshama. The body got pure just like the Neshama. Where am I going to find such a thing? All he wants to do the body is serve you. That's all he wants to do the body. Neshama, of course, is pure. But it's a given. The body, all he wants to do, has no Yetzirah. Yetzirah is scared. Ran away. Went to warm up. Maybe buy some weapons. What is he going to do? The body is scared of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Yetzirah is scared of Moshe Rabbeinu. Pure. Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon knew this and says, I need to purify my body to the, such an extent that it's Kodesh. Kodesh means we have to endure some growing pains. I forget one of the names of one of the Chachamim. I think it's the Rabbi, I don't want to misquote the name. One of the big Gdolei Adon in previous generation. Mamash, last maybe 40, 50 years. Uh, says on his uh, last will and testament type of dog, you know, the things that they write at the end of their life, in their books and so on, said, I, I must apologize. He says, you know, thank you to this, thank you to Hashem, thank you to my wife, thank you to this, thank you to this, and I must apologize to my body for torturing it my whole life. Never feeding it, never letting it sleep, never letting it enjoy itself, never letting it fulfill its desires. I must apologize to my body. I'm sorry for torturing you so much. Why? This is far from us. This is like giving you a shiur about Kabbalah. Telling you Kabbalah, those things are happening in Shemaim. It's far from us. Why? All we want to do is enjoy our body. All we want to do is enjoy this world. Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon, all he did was bring on himself pain. Why? He realized this is how you make yourself holy. I'm not recommending this. This is Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon. I'll get to a point momentarily. After he died, Rabbi Akadosh, Rabbi Uda Nasi, sent a message to his wife, to his widow. He says, uh, I'd like to marry you. Tzadika, Kedusha. Her husband died. She's a husband. Who's better? Rabbi Akadosh. 
איש צדיק, צדיקה, why not? I know you come from a good family, a husband, Kodesh Kodeshim, I know, if you want, if you take, I'd love to marry you. She says, you're like sand. You don't go down. She goes, she says to Rabbi Kadosh that the entire generation says, if Mashiach came, it's Rabbi Kadosh. Gemara says it. If Rabbi came, if the Mashiach came in that generation, it would be Rabbi. It would be Rabbi Udanasi. That's who it would be. The wife of Rabbi Eliezer, the widow, says to him, I can't downgrade to sand. You're sand next to my ex-husband. It's not nice to say such a thing. See, I'm not interested. I'm not interested like today. No one's interested in anyone. Boys are not interested in girls. Girls are not interested in boys. Everybody wants something they can't have. The 20-year-olds want to marry the, uh, the, the, the 50-year-olds. The 50-year-olds want to marry the 20-year-olds. But nobody wants to marry each other anymore. Everybody wants to marry somebody rich, and they don't want to work. Everybody wants to marry a supermodel, but they don't want anyone to look at her either. You know? Strange. Strange world we live in today. Say, I'm not interested. She's not insulting him. She's explaining to him, Musal. What's Musa? You do not get to be Rabbi, El- Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon without Mesirut Nefesh, without self-sacrifice. The type of Mesirut Nefesh my husband made, that's the only thing I could judge. His Torah and your Torah, I don't know. I wasn't his Chavuta. I don't know what Torah he knew and I don't know what Torah you know. I can't judge that. I'm not a Tamidah Chachama. But I know what he brought on himself, all the pain he brought on himself. I know what kind of self-sacrifice he was willing to do to sanctify his body. Do you have such a thing? Now, the Keila, the local community, the Gemara says, did not like Rabbi Eliezer. Why? Because he, one, his job was he would tell on the uh, to the Romans, he would go to the Romans and tell to the Romans about all the Jewish criminals. Sometimes a Jewish criminal stealing from people and doing bad to them, so somebody has to do something. Now, sometimes, unfortunately, this is very, very much uh, a reality today. We take the Torah and misinterpret it. We say, No, you can't hurt your brothers. So, I want I'm going to go tell the Goim. About my brother that's uh, made a crime, I can't. We'll solve it in, in our own community. This, by the way, Rabotai, in most cases, in most cases, is allowed. But in, in other cases, it's not only that it's not allowed, it's 100% forbidden. To such an extent that it creates Chilul Hashem. Now, if, let's say, for example, there is a business issue, Landlord wants to get money that they don't deserve. Tenant doesn't want to pay money they have they owe. Uh, you know, a uh, one partner wants to buy out the other partner. One partner stole from the other partner. Things like this. Yes, you go to a bed dean. You go to a bed dean. You take care of the problem. Jewish bed dean. Both parties show up to the bed dean. You're obligated to go to bed dean, and you solve the problem. Who's right? Who's wrong? If you invite someone to a bed-deen, you invite the person that you have a problem with to a bed-deen, and they reject the bed-deen's invitation, they reject it. The community has to put that person on cherem, meaning can't count them on minyan, can't use them as witness for anything. It's a cherem, like a mechalel Shabbat. Why? You're going against Jewish law. Meaning, to go to a civil court... It's only if we have no other option. So if somebody stole from you and you want to take, uh, get the money back, you invite him to a bed dean. So you solve the problem and pay. Now if the bed dean rules in your favor and he still doesn't want to pay, you have to take that to a uh, court. Now it's in today's age, they change it into the judgment into an arbitration ruling because the government doesn't accept Jewish law. So they, use, they turn it into an arbitration ruling. Long story short, Rabotai, is that in many cases you can deal with 
within a community. But there are some cases that not only you cannot deal with in the community, it's forbidden. It's asu. But unfortunately, many people are making these mistakes. Many communities are making these mistakes. And this has to do with such things like rape, molestation, pedophilia, all of these sick people that hurt little children, hurt women, hurt people that are, you know, can't defend themselves. These people, there's nothing for the community to do. Why? Because the only punishment for a community is something we can't do. The only punishment the Torah says that you do with such people is you kill them. Now, we're not allowed to kill them. So what do you have to do? You have to take them to the cops. You have to take them to the government. So for anyone to harbor a rabbi or religious person or even a common Jew, because he's Jewish, even though he's a rapist, a pedophile, a sick individual, a murderer of some kind, either a murderer of neshamot or of bodies or both, this is a sin the Chilul Hashem on the entire community. And there's organizations that recently, Baruch Hashem, have been founded to try to expose these people. I mean, it's problematic also because in reality, nothing really changes. Even if you expose them, even if you expose them, the communities are not going to change for the most part. In reality, you're just increasing the Chilul Hashem. But nonetheless, hopefully they succeed, these organizations that have it. There's one particular one, I think, in Florida, that has uh, succeeded in bringing up a lot of things that uh, have been hidden under under uh, the table for a long time. But in reality, Rabotai, this is why we have a Torah. Our Torah is our instruction book. And we have to realize, listen, we, we cannot exercise our law. We have to go to the green. We have to go to the law. If we can't exercise our law, if somebody doesn't want to pay you for your business, doesn't want to go to Bedin, you go to civil court. So why is it when somebody hurt a child or a woman, you're not going to them? Why? No, we're going to solve it within ourselves. Okay, you tried, but it didn't work out to solve it within ourselves. He already did it with two, three, four, five kids. How many? How many? How many do you want? How many? Why does this happen? I'll tell you why it happens. Arav Shpadron, Allah Shalom, one time he saw a little kid fall and break his head like uh, you know injure his head blood gushing everywhere so but don't ran over there to, to, to help the kid put something to cover him and so on and he started you know taking the kid back to his house where do you live little kid where do you live took the kid and as he was coming there was older lady this older lady was saying ah don't work for the rab everything's okay Baruch Hashem. He's still young. He's still healthy. I fell when I was young. Hashem protected me. Hashem took care of us. No worries. Now, as he gets closer and closer, the older woman sees who the boy is. She says, Moishele! Ah! She starts screaming and yelling, No, Moishele, what happened to you? Hashem she starts hitting ourselves like the old, you know, Moroccan and Tripoli women do. In the old days, they used to hit themselves because of nervousness. What happened? No, Chas Shalom, Hashem, why'd you do this to us? Wait a minute. Now everybody else came. All the neighborhood came to us. No, don't worry. We fell when we were kids. Hashem will take care of them. It's okay. What happened? What changed in the story, Rav Shpadon says? What's the changed in the story? All that changed in the story is that when it became your Moishele, you cared. Until then, you pretended to be a tzaddikah. Until then, you pretended like you have emunah in Hashem. Everybody has emunah in Hashem for other people's business. Somebody doesn't have any money, he asks you for a loan. Nah, don't worry. Hashem will take care of you. You don't need money from me. Hashem will take care of you. Trust, trust, trust Hashem. I'm not giving you the money, not because I want to give you the money. I'm not giving you the money because I believe Hashem is going to take care of you. It's a bigger miracle for you. I'm doing you a favor. I'm doing you a favor by not lending you the money. I'm doing you a favor by not helping you out. The kids are starving for three days. They haven't eaten. I'm doing you a favor. Why? I'm going to sh- Hashem's trying to show you something. I don't want to ruin it. All of a sudden, me a Shlomo Alava Katuv Omer, Shlomo Melech says, don't be overly righteous. Meaning, righteous on somebody else's cheshbon, somebody else's accounting. 
Be righteous with your own stuff, not with their stuff. But unfortunately, we are always righteous with everybody else. We're always righteous with everybody else. People send me emails all the time, and messages all the time. I don't know how can you stand it. You know, the Jewish people are so secular. And this, they're going against the Shem, Allah, and the files of complaints against Am Yisrael. And say, oh, so what, your whole family is religious? Everybody in your family is religious? No, you don't know anybody, nobody in your family. Everybody's Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Eliezer, Ben Hokino, everybody. He goes, no, I'm the only one. I'm like, oh, so why don't you tell them? I don't want it's uncomfortable. It's my family. It's this. I'm like, wow, but I'm Israel sinners and they're a Shaim and Shem's gonna punish them. How come you don't say that to them, to your family? How come you don't say the Shaim, they, they, all the stuff that you're saying about your family? How come? How come it's only about everybody else? How can you stand it? How can you this? How can you that? Everybody else. Why? It doesn't hurt. It's not your Moishele. As soon as it becomes your Moshe Le, all of a sudden the Cheshbon changes. And that, Rabotai, is one of the deepest problems we have in the world today. If it's not our Moshe Le, we care less. Care less. I tell people to do Kiruv, eh, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will donate. Somebody else will arrange the lecture. Somebody else will get the people. Somebody else will speak. Somebody else will study. Somebody else will do everything. I got my own problems to deal with. Until your brother comes home with a non-Jew and like, oh, Kodagav, you got to save him. You got to save him, Kodagav. What save him? The wedding is tomorrow. What save him? You should have told me three years ago when he started dating her. What save him? What do you want me to do exactly? You think I'm a Moshe Rabbeinu? Even Moshe Rabbeinu can't do nothing right now. It's three years later. What are you going to do? What do you think? What, 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 what's, how come you only started caring when it's your Moishele? That's the problem. We only care when it's our Moishele. So, Rabbi Udan Asi saw that Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon was Kodesh Kodeshim. But when did he see it clearly? Since the community did not like Rabbi Eliezer, you want to find out why. Why they didn't like him? Because he would tell on the Rashaim to the, to the to Romans. Somebody's hurting little kids. He tells the Romans why. They're the cops. They have the law. They have the knives. They have the swords. They have the power. Go tell them. Why? Because the Jewish people didn't want to, you know, fulfill the law or they couldn't, didn't have the, uh, the strength to do it. So he would add, listen, this guy is, even though he's a Jew, he's hurting other Jews. We must do something. So other people didn't like it so much. How come you're sending them to the goyim? One person, the Gemara says, Baba Metzia says, said, your father was wine, but you're vinegar. Your father was wine, but you're vinegar. So Rabbi Eliezer tells his wife, listen, the community doesn't like me, so they're not going to honor me when I die. So just leave my body in the attic. Don't bury me, because no one's going to come. They're not going to disrespect me. Just leave my body in the attic. What leave your body in the attic? Somebody dies, Shem Echem, within a few hours, or Shem Echem, what kind of smell comes out? Within a few minutes. It's not a comfortable situation. Within a few hours, things start to... It's a very uncomfortable situation. This one person that's a Talmud Chacham told me some of the things that happen in the grave. Shem Echem. Just that. It's worse than any gain I'm sure I could ever give you. Just think about what happens in the group. He's telling her, leave me in the attic? Leave me in the attic. She leaves him in the attic for over 20 years. Over 20 years, not a single smell, not a single decay, nothing. It's like he's sleeping. It's like he's sleeping. Why? He sanctified his body. He sanctified his body. His body became Sefer Torah. Rabbi Uda, Rabbi Uda saw what happened over here. This is not a normal situation. It's not somebody that just learned some Torah, even in those days. Not everybody was like that. Someone sanctified his body to such an extent. Ah, the secret is the Isurim, the, 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 uh, 
the self-sacrifice that he did. He brought on himself self-sacrifice. He brought on himself suffering. I'm going to do the same thing. So now, Rebbe Kadosh already had 16 years of suffering on his own. Remember when he, I told you the story a week or two weeks ago, I told you the story where he didn't have mercy on a uh, little calf. Hashem gave him a uh, uh, suffering for 16 years because he didn't, until he did tshuva. I think I quoted 13, but it's actually 16 years. Here, here, he brought on himself 13 years of suffering. So it was a total of 29 years. What did he do? The first seven years, he gave what by most people's definition is the worst possible pain a male can experience in this world. What is it? Stones. Kidney stones. Kidney stones, anyone who doesn't understand the pain of a kidney stone, a You should pray to Hashem just for that alone. Just for that alone. Everything else you're obligated to do, a But... Just the fact that you don't have kidney stones, you don't even know what it means to have a kidney stones. Do you? You're looking at me like five heads. Like, what's so wrong with kidney stones? Stone, kidney, big deal. Stone, big. His kidney is this big. Stone is this big. Big deal. What's the big deal? Shem Echem, what a pain you have. What? You have a kidney stone. It hurts from the second, from the, to the moment it's here, all the way until it leaves your body. With no end. There's no like, oh, it's calm down. And many, unfortunately, have to have surgery. Some you can't even fix. He brought on himself kidney stones where every single trickle that came out, every little urine, a little bit of one drop, hurt to such an extent that he had to scream at the top of his lungs. Again, they hurt him in the ocean for seven years. The other six years, toothache. What toothache? What toothache? What's it called? No, I told you guys. Tzafdina. Tzafidna. Tzafidna. He brought on himself seven years of Tzafidna. Special toothache with the tooth and the gums. Why? To sanctify your body, you have to go through suffering. Now, why? Why do you have to go through suffering? Because sometimes the only way you're going to understand is when it's your Moishele. Sometimes the only way you're going to understand how to rule favorably in Am Yisrael's favor is when you feel their pain. Now you probably read this several times in the book of Exodus when we're introduced to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, little baby, doo -doo -doo -doo, cute little baby, they put him in a basket. Batya, Bat Paro, Rasha, she saves him. Why is she called Batya? She decided that instead of being Bat Paro, the daughter of Paro, she wants to be daughter of God. She started making fun of her father, saying, what are you, 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 you made yourself into an idol. You Rasha. Go into God. Yeah, we're going to become one of the slaves. No matter. She became the daughter of God. God gave her the name. Batya. Ya means the name of Hashem. Because of that, when she went to the ceremony of going into the mikveh, Hashem told her, go to the mikveh, go to the dip in the ocean, go dip in the, in the Nile River. As a present, he gave up Moshe Rabbeinu. She said Moshe Rabbeinu. And then it says, Rabotai, Vaigdal Moshe. What does it mean, Vaigdal Moshe? Moshe got bigger. Well, we really need the Torah to tell us that he got bigger. Everybody gets bigger. How come it doesn't say, Vaigdal Yitzchak, Vaigdal Yaakov? Vaigdal Avraham. We have stories of Avraham Avinu being a little baby. It doesn't say Vaigdal Avraham and he's a big baby. And he's an adult now. It doesn't say Yitzchak went from uh, nothing to something. It say Vaigdal. How come it says Vaigdal Moshe? I heard this originally from Rav Nisim again, I love Shalom. It's something extraordinary. In reality, the Chachamim tell us Vaigdal Moshe does not mean that he increased size, increased age. That's a given. It's a Kalvachomer. Torah is not trying to tell you that. He started taking notice of his brother's and sister's pain. He saw Ami Sayyid's pain, he couldn't take it. And he said, it's time for me to do something. It's time for me to do something to save Am Israel. Why? The suffering. His pain 
became the same as their pain. When he saw the Egyptian trying to kill a Jew, he didn't kill the Egyptian because this was the only mishap that happened. He actually felt the Jew's pain. When he decided that this, I'm going to go do that, I'm going to go save, I'm going to put my life on the line, he goes sit with Saddam Hussein, with Paro over there, in the castle, doing nothing all day. What's the problem? No, can't do it. Why? My brothers are in pain. My brothers are in pain, I can't do it. Vaigdal Moshe means he started feeling their pain, and he decided, it's time for me to do Kiruv. It's time for me to do something. It's time for me to save them. How? Put my life on the line. Put my life on the line. So the Chachamim ask a question. How come Hashem didn't bring him sooner? We're in Egypt for 210 years. 86 out of those 10 years were avodat parech, meaning work with no results. What does it mean work with no results? The Chachamim explained to us that the Egyptians were so evil, all they want to do is crush our morale. How do you crush somebody's morale? Give them no results. They build something, the Egyptians destroy it. So even the joy of saying, you know what? I didn't get paid for building the bridge, but at least I could tell my son, hey, you see that bridge? I built it. Yeah, but Abba, we can't pay rent. Yeah, but I built a bridge. Yeah, but Abba, I haven't eaten in three days. But aren't you proud of your Abba for building that bridge? One day you're going to build that bridge. No, Abba, I'm going to get a different job. They're going to pay me my job. No, son, they're not. It's the same Egyptians. I'm telling you your future, but at least you have something to be proud of. You build a bridge. Even this, the Egyptians, Imach Shema B'Zicham, didn't want us to have. Even this. Avodat parach meaning you work with no bracha. A lot of people today work with no bracha. People go to work, but they feel they never have any money. You ever meet some of those people? People go to work. They wake up, they go to work. They go to sleep, they go to work. There's a the never ending of work. Even they wake up in the morning, like I used to. I used to wake up already tired. Woke up from sleep tired. Why? I felt like I was working the whole night. You go to work, you make whatever you make, you never have any money. How do you never have any money? You made a million dollars last year. You don't have any money. You made $70,000 last year. I don't have any money. There are people in the world that live off of nothing. How can you not survive with $70,000, $50,000, $30,000? How come you can't survive? How come you don't have any money ever? People will say, yeah, I'm always short. I'm like, what do you do? Oh, I'm a such and such. I'm like, oh, you, they don't pay you? No, no, but we make. Baruch Hashem, make $70,000 a year, $60,000 a year. So how come you don't have any money? No, you know we have, but uh, you know I need to I need to put some money on the side, and I need to manage my portfolio and such and such. It's cause you have you just cheap. Or we spend so much of our money trying to be the Joneses that we really don't have any money. But Rabotai, a lot of people have these money problems not because Hashem didn't give the money. He just didn't give him bracha. He gave him the money. 60,000, 70,000, 80,000, 90,000, 100,000, 200,000, 500,000, a million dollars, five million dollars, ten million dollars. No bracha. Inside they feel like they're broke. Even though in actuality sometimes they're not, sometimes they are. Depends. How do I know? I was one of them. Didn't matter how much we made, we never had money. I could buy whatever I want, but I never had any money though. It was always month to month. Whatever I made that month, that, at the end of the month, it was gone. Somehow, some way. And don't say, no, no, you bought a lot of jewelry, a lot of cars, a lot of choppers, and pl- nothing, no toys. My car was a, a $90,000 car, which for somebody who was making so much money is nothing. My biggest expense was my apartment. Other than that, nothing. I never bought a piece of jewelry in my life. Anyway, my family's in the jewelry business. No toys. Never have any money. Why? No bracha. Many people work non-stop. No bracha in the money. No bracha in the money. Very serious problem. So now back to our story. We have Moshe Rabbeinu Vaigdal Moshe. Moshe got bigger. Bigger how? Mesirut Nefesh. Self-sacrifice for Am Yisrael. He started feeling their pain. He started feeling their pain, and that was enough. He couldn't do it. So the Chachamim asked, how come Hashem didn't bring him 210 years ago? Why wait so long? Well, first of all, we should know that in the beginning of, uh, of the exile, 
in the beginning of uh, Egypt, we were actually good over there. Yosef HaTzadik was a uh, viceroy. We were printing money over there. We were doing good. We were living good. What's the problem? But that didn't last for long. Why? Beginning of Parashat Shmod says, and uh, a new paro came that uh, forgot who Yosef was. Didn't know who Yosef was. In reality, the Chachamim say, it's really the same paro. It's just that Yosef died, and he pretended like he doesn't remember anymore. Even though his pictures are all over the walls. He's the one that put you on the map. He's the one that built the country. Said So now why didn't Hashem bring Moshe at that moment? Why didn't he just, if it's not Moshe, he wasn't born yet, bring somebody else. Bring somebody else, not Moshe. Moshe is not born yet. Bring somebody else. Before Paro starts killing people, enslaving them, Shemachem killing little kids, uh, torturing people. Oh, you have no idea. If you read the Midrashim of what happened to us in Egypt, if you actually read what happened to us in Egypt, it will change your mind completely about a lot of things, including the Holocaust. Of course, the Holocaust was a disaster of disasters, but only modern. In comparison to what happened in, in, in uh, Egypt, can't compare. I'm serious, you can't compare. It was much worse in Egypt. Much more people died. Many, many more people died in Egypt. Much uh, gruesome. I mean, you can't compare. Obviously, this is something we remember. as even survivors that we know and so on and so forth. But the point is, about time, many people don't know and don't realize how horrible Egypt really was. So the question again, why didn't Hashem bring Moshe sooner? Or somebody like Moshe. You know what the answer is? The answer is sickening, actually. And the reason why is because we still, we have the Torah for 3,300 years, and we still haven't learned anything. What's the answer? Nobody stepped up. Until Moshe Rabbeinu stepped up 210 years after we were in Egypt, no one stepped up and said, I want to save Am Yisrael. No one stepped up. No one stepped up. That's the reason. That's why Hashem did not bring Moshe. That's why Hashem did not bring anyone. Because no one said, okay, I'm going to put my life on the line to go save Am Yisrael. Everyone asked you, no, my parents and my job and my girlfriend and my boyfriend, I don't have any money, I don't have any time, and I have to learn myself and I have to go write a book. And everybody's excuses of why they can't do the same thing we have today. 3,000 years ago, same thing. Nothing changed. Like Shlomo Amelach says, nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. The issue of Mesirut Nefesh is so far from us today. You tell people about Torah, you could teach them for three hours. And then all they ask you is like, okay, so how do I get both worlds? I want to enjoy this world and I want to enjoy the next world. I want to live like Donald Trump here and Moshe Rabbeinu there. What's the problem? No one says that you're not allowed to enjoy this world. Actually, matter of fact, as the Gemara says, if you don't enjoy certain foods, Hashem is going to go and say, at the end of 120 years, say to you, how come you didn't enjoy that food? I gave I brought it in the world. How come you didn't enjoy it? There's certain things Hashem brought to the world for you to enjoy. It all depends on how holy you want to be and which world you're going to invest more money into. Now, people invest their life savings into their house. They invest an enormous amount of money into their house. They have mortgages bigger than their life. They put all their money into to have the down payment. And the rest of it is on the mortgage. The mortgage is bigger than their career. It's bigger than their dreams even. And they want to have this big house, Baruch Hashem. Rabbi Ephraim once asked, has anybody made any down payments on their house in Shemaim? Has anybody even remotely thought about the house they're going to have in Shemaim? Because people spend so much time investing in the house here. What about the one in Shemaim? You even have a down payment? And the reality is, Rabotai, is that most people are just simply not willing to do what's necessary. And it got to such a point that many rabbis don't even discuss it. Many rabbis just simply just don't discuss what you really need to do. I'm not saying you have to be homeless and uh, in the middle of the street begging for change to bring suffering onto yourself. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that 
No one is expecting us to be Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon to start praying for Hashem to give us pain. Dafka. We're not on that level anyway. No one is saying that we have to be Moshe Rabbeinu, Mashiach. Not only Hashem decides if we have it that, at that level. Even though the Rambam says every single person can be Moshe Rabbeinu. Can get to the potential of Moshe Rabbeinu, meaning fulfill 100% of their potential. What we are saying is that 210 years we were in Egypt only because not enough people cared. Why? It wasn't their Moshele. It wasn't personal to them. How long do we have to wait for us to care now and actually start investing into Am Yisrael? Tom Israel, Mamash, take action, do something about it. A lot of people talk big, but they're not willing to do much about it. They're not willing to do much about it. Even the ones that give money, they're not giving their life savings. They're not giving something that's really meaningful to them. They give whatever, pocket change. Even if it's thousands in many cases. To them, it's pocket change. It's all relative. Why? They care just enough. Just enough. Just enough to just, they're doing it to make themselves good, not make themselves feel good, not necessarily because they care about Am Yisrael. That Mesirut Nefesh is, is, is lost on us. It's mamash lost on us. And that's one of the most important things that a person needs to understand is that if you want to put a serious down payment on your house in Shamaim, you have to start with Mesirut Nefesh. You have to start with making yourself uncomfortable for the sake of Am Yisrael. Not for your own sake. Not because you want to uh, have a bigger house or you want to pray to Hashem an extra time. So now instead of praying three times a day, you're going to pray four. Why? Because you say, if I pray three times a day, He's going to give me a regular house. Pray four times, He's going to give me a bigger house. If I pray, if I do tefillin, uh, regular tefillin, He's going to give me uh, a good job. If I get extra nice tefillin, He's going to give me a bigger job. Not for you. Not praying for you. Not wanting for you. Not wanting for you. A little bit of time. Just a little. A little bit of time. Five minutes a day. Ten minutes a day. An hour a day. Whatever you can do. Whatever you can sacrifice for your brothers. And just pray for Am Yisrael. Just do something for Am Yisrael. Something. Something for them. And don't tell me, no, I give challah to, to my neighbor. Okay, that's your neighbor. I'm not saying your neighbor. I'm saying the nation. Pray for them, Tehilim. It's worth more than your challah. That is something that we're missing. That Mesirut Nefesh. To make ourselves holy. We're not going to be Rabbi. We're not going to be Rabbi Eliezer ben uh, Orkinoz or Rabbi Eliezer ben Rabbi Shimon or Moshe Rabbeinu right now. It's going to take us time. We're still trying to do Tshuva Bechal. But to pray a little bit for Am Yisrael, to do something for Am Yisrael, to do something to save them before this exile gets uglier and uglier and the sicknesses get worse and worse. And the punishments get worse and worse. And all the kaparat avonot that are growing around us start getting closer to home. Don't wait for it to be your moishele, is what I'm trying to tell you. Don't wait for it to be your moishele. That's really the cure. That's the cure for you. That's the cure for me. That's the cure for the nation. The rest of it is additives. The rest of it is extra stuff that you should do. But in reality, Rabotai, this is the one major ingredient that even the lefty liberals would agree with. Only thing we disagree on is how to do it. They think that by just donating a bunch of money to dolphins and elephants and tell, sending people to, uh, to, to trips is solving, uh, solving the Jewish crisis. The reality speaks otherwise. With all of the uh, trips to Israel that the uh, former hedge fund manager, uh, Michael Steinhardt, funded, who's an atheist by himself, by the way, with the, uh, the Aliyot, he funded who knows how many people taking trips, young kids taking their first trip to Israel, even though he himself, in the name of religion, but he himself is an atheist. I read in his, uh, I met him once, first of all, and I read in his book. I think it's called No Bull or something like that. Very smart in, uh, in, in, in finance. Very stupid in life. 
but he likes Jewish tradition because he grew up among you know he grew up, grew up among uh, religious people but those trips are about it's very nice to go and take a trip to Israel hang out see the uh, mountains it's nice it's not gonna save Amish life if anything it's destroying more souls than helping them it's nice it's not gonna save anybody it's gonna destroy more people all of these community funded trips of how they take people on trips let's go as a community do a trip to Israel and see Jerusalem and see this and see that that's all nice it's not gonna save on Israel. all these Hanukkah parties and Purim parties and all these different types of parties they're all nice they're not saving anybody though Mashiach is not coming because that trip happened Rabotai, it's time for each and every single person to start thinking big start thinking what if what if Moshe Rabbeinu never came the suffering would continue what if today it's your job not forever but just for today today your job is you be Moshe Rabbeinu today tomorrow somebody else is gonna take the role but today you be this week you be today you sacrifice yourself Am Yisrael how whatever it is that you think is good for Am Yisrael obviously in accordance with the Torah and that's one of the things that we're missing and the reason why is because Mesirut Nefesh self-sacrifice in this generation is is, is 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 gone it's something that we think is a uh, uh, just it's not it's not for us we don't want it we want to enjoy this world I'm not saying for you to, to, to suffer but I'm telling you that you have to do something for the nation any questions Have to have some questions. You want to finish this? You were here? Yeah. Um, we were learning in Sector uh, Torah Sanhedrin. Okay. The interpolation of the moon. I was curious as to why that's conducted by the lower court, the three judges, as opposed to the, the great judge and so on. Okay. Which seems to be you know, very significant. Three judges yeah. versus 71, yeah. Correct. Why? Why? It, why three judges versus 71? Because they, uh, first of all, 71 only had one location. The three judges were in every place. Uh, so the, uh, the moon, if we only waited for the 71, if we only waited for the 71, that means that by default, it would only be when they saw it. Now maybe the moon came up somewhere else before they saw it. Or maybe it's cloudy where they are. In reality, they can't see the moon. So then we have the wrong date because why we depended it for it to be only over there only where they are it's not where they are it's where the moon is we have to go where the moon is not where the people are so since the senate three senate three judges were in different locations whoever was the first one to see it they had people on the mountains they would see it they would report it to the judges and then they would after they report it they confirm it's Rosh Chodesh they would pass on from, you know, they would light a fire on top of the mountain and someone from far away would see the fire. And then he would light his fire. And then another mountain would light a fire. And all of that, that's how, that's how communication was done in those days, is they would light fires on top of mountains and you can't communicate uh, via uh, uh, text messaging or talking because you can't hear each other. But you can't wait until he gets to the other mountain. It may take two, three days. But, Baruch Hashem, we're able to see light even 10, 20 miles away. In those days, even longer. They had better vision back then. So you could see the, the message from who's the first one that saw the moon. So that's why. Next. You guys know the rest of the Torah. That's it, we're finished. What time is it now? Still early, I think. Hey, I have a question. Go ahead. Ken. Ken. Yeah. What happened to that? Okay, so that not, the uh, it's not moved on, I guess. No, well it is and it isn't. It is and it isn't. 
the part that is, is that if you go to uh, Sephardic shuls all over the United States, and both Sephardic and most Ashkenazi shuls in Israel, you'll see that every day during Amidah, the Amidah prayer, which is we do three times a day, during the Amidah of the morning and during the Amidah of the afternoon, the Mincha, there's Birkat Kohanim, which is when the Kohanim, there's whoever's a Kohen, which doesn't necessarily mean that their last name is Kohen. It could be singer even. They just know that they come from the lineage of Kohen. Um, and they go to the front, and they, uh, when the uh, Chazan repeats the, uh, the prayer, they, uh, you know, uh, goes over the Amidah again. The Kohanim are in front, and they uh, do a blessing uh, that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu told Aaron, and Aaron told the people uh, to bless the people. When Hashem said, bless the people, this was specific words that they used, and the Kohanim cover themselves with the talit, and it's a very, very beautiful uh, ceremony, especially if you're able to go to the Kotel, uh, the Western Wall in Israel, uh, during uh, during Yomim Noraim, you're during the, the the high holidays, the Birkat Kohanim at that point is uh, hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands even of people covering themselves and so on. It's a very very beautiful thing. Uh, so that Birkat Kohanim is we do daily. In the United States, there's a minag that Ashkenazi uh, communities, most of them, if not all of them, but most of them have this uh, minag that. They're not going to do Birkat Kohanim unless it's twice a year. Twice a year, which is Yom Kippur, and I believe in Sukkot. Sukkot or Roshan Sukkot, I think it was. Twice a year, the, the Ashkenazis do Birkat Kohanim. Other than that, they don't do it the rest of the year. The Sephardis in America, as well as all over the world, do it throughout every day. Every day of the year. In Israel, many Ashkenazim also do the same thing as the Sephardim. And that's why some of the Chachamim that come, the, the Ashkenazi Chachamim, that come from Israel to the United States, even if they're Ashkenazi, they pray with the Sephardim. Why? They want to go and, and be part of the Bekat Kohanim. It has a lot of uh, very, very mystical and very uh, magical things that uh, you get if, it, if the Kohen is righteous and, and it's, a, it's a good one. You get a lot of uh, amazing things with Bekat Kohanim. Um, so on that end, the same blessing that Aaron Cohen fulfilled in Bet HaMikdash, we have. Uh, Aaron Cohen fulfilled in, in the tabernacle in, in, uh, in, um, in the desert, we have. Same thing we did in Bet HaMikdash, we have. Now, as far as the... Uh, as far as the other ceremonies of the, of the Cohen. We don't have a bet to Mikdash. So, for example, the Choshen, the, the breastplate that he had, the eight pieces of clothing that the Kohen Gadol would wear, we don't have those anymore. Because we'd also, number one, we don't have the bet to Mikdash. Number two, all the things, all the tools of the bet to Mikdash, for the most part, were stolen from us by the Christians. The Catholic Church, for example, the Vatican, has a, uh, the, one of the top ten most secure buildings in the entire planet. The Vatican, Imachshima. Now, in one of the floors of the Vatican, in one of the floors of the Vatican, I, some say it's the third floor under the ground, they have artifacts, different things from previous generations that they don't disclose to the public. Uh, and many say that some of the things that are in there are actually things from the Bet HaMikdash. And there's one, at least one eyewitness at least one eyewitness that's from this, that's alive, and well today, that said he saw it with his own eyes. He saw it with his own eyes, they have the menorah, uh, and a few other things from the Bet HaMikdash. Um, so, as far as using, even if we had it, there's nothing we could do with it. We don't have a Bet HaMikdash. The other duties of the, of the Kohanim was to purify the people. To purify the people, number one, you needed a red cow. You need the red cow, and you also need the holy water. Again, Bet HaMikdash. So most of the things of the Kohanim, we can't do anyway. As far as blessings of the Kohanim, we can do, which we do. Uh, so in essence, whatever is relevant to us, we do. 
whatever is not relevant to us, we can't do. It's not even a matter of uh, we, we don't do, we can't do. So technically right now, we're obligated to fulfill all of the mitzvot of the Bet HaMikdash. Right now, all of us are obligated to do everything that we would do in a Bet HaMikdash. So why are we not doing it? Because we're not a Bet HaMikdash. So we're considered anusim. Anusim meaning it's beyond your control. Meaning if today, Bezat Hashem, next morning, Hashem builds a Bet HaMikdash, He brings it from Shamaim, like the Nevi'im say, He's going to bring a ready-made Bet HaMikdash. You don't need to build anything. A ready-made Bet HaMikdash is going to come down from Shamaim, and from that moment on, we have to go bring the sacrifices and do everything at the Bet HaMikdash. doesn't matter that you have work tomorrow, or you, you don't have enough money, <laughs> all those things don't make a difference. You have to go to Bet HaMikdash, you have to do a, a Kobanot. Why? You're full of sins, like me. Maybe better than me, but I have some sins. I have to go to Bet HaMikdash twice, probably. The point is, is we have to go to Bet HaMikdash. Why? We have to do Kaparat Abono. All the, all the Kaparat we have to do for all the sins we made and so on and so forth. Plus, the Kohen has to purify us. So with the red cow, they have to take the red cow, they have to slaughter it, and they have to burn it. They have to combine it with, uh, with the holy water and a certain type of plant together. Do, 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 and the Kohen has to purify us. And then somebody has to purify him after he's finished. That's one of the secrets of the red cow that Shlomo Melech never understood of how the one that purifies the people be, himself becomes impure. That's what Shlomo Melech says. This law, I don't understand. Everything else I understand. The law of the red cow, I don't understand. If the pure is making pure, I understand. If the impure is making impure, I understand. But the, imp, the pure is making the impure pure, I understand. But why does the pure that's making the impure pure become impure himself? It's not that he started impure. He becomes impure through the purification. Shlomo Melech says, I don't understand. This is beyond me. I don't understand. Yeah. Wouldn't it just be like transferring energy to something? Meaning? Can but it doesn't it doesn't make sense for the uh, for the for the one that's actually making other people pure for him to become impure because it's going to the cow it's not going to if if let's say what you're saying he's uh, making everyone pure and it's the cow that's in essence be the sacrifice for the people then it should go to the cow not him. Because the same water, the same water he's using, same water, he's spl- sprinkling it on us. So it's spr- the same water is, goes on us, and we become pure. So in essence, the water is a purifier. But for him, that he's sprinkling it, it's making him impure. So this is something that's beyond the norm. This is something that there's no rational uh, explanation for it, because it's not supposed to be. This is simply because God said so. That's the real reason. Next question. Any other questions? You had enough already? Two minutes? You finished the over, overdose with, uh, with the talk that I just had? Uh, <coughs> Ken. Right. So could could a rabbi go there or could a regular Jew go there given that the Alakad is that a Jew who will not even enter a church or even look at a church? So you answered your own question? No, I'm asking because of the story of people who who have been in that place. Because there's sinners doesn't make it doesn't make it allowed. Doesn't make it allowed because there's sinners. Um there is a, uh, unfortunately, a common understanding that um, sometimes we get our proofs based on people's actions, but that's not the way. The, the Gemara Yerushalmi uh, specifically says we don't learn our laws from other people's behavior. We learn our laws based on 
what Hashem said. What did Hashem say? How do we know what did Hashem say? The Chachamim wrote it in, uh, in books, and also Hashem has the five books of Moses. That's how we know what Hashem said. Everything else, we, uh, we're not worried about how, what people do and what people don't do. So, for example, when we bring people up to the, 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 uh, the sugya, the issue, the complication, the contradiction, the uh, whole issue with Pe'anochrit, the, uh, the wigs. Um, people say, yeah, but how is it possible that most of the religious world are wearing wigs? So it must be allowed. And the proof that that is a flawed, not only a flawed argument, but a flawed understanding of just general, is that you can say the same thing about all of Judaism. Meaning, even more than, let's say right now, there's two, three million women that are wearing wigs right now and believe that it's kosher, there is 18 million that don't keep Shabbat. It's 18 million that don't keep Shabbat. So if the majority wins, then it would also, it would also cancel out the entire Torah. Since most of Am Yisrael does not keep Shabbat, that would mean that it's canceled. Obviously, Chas Shalom, you can never even, uh, even think such a thing. So the fact that some people do or don't do is irrelevant. The Torah says a Jew is not allowed to go into a church. There's no uh, maybe, yes, no, no. He's not allowed to go into a church. It's, it's no if, ands, or buts. He's not allowed to go into a church to such an extent that if someone was chasing him, chas v'shalom, to kill him, and he had a option to go into a mosque or to go into a church, he should go to the mosque. Why? Because at least over there, it's not Abu Zarah. The, even though many people believe or want to believe that uh, Islam is Abu Dazara, is, is idol worship, it's not. Allah is the same God as the God of Israel. They just believe they're the sword of Allah. They believe that they are punishing Am Yisrael because we did not follow Allah. We did not follow God, the same God. They don't, uh, they don't believe that uh, it's, a, uh, it's a different God. And it's also not a three, a God turned into three like Christianity. Obviously, they're considered heretics and they're considered fools for what they're doing and they'll get, uh, they'll get punished for everything that they're doing. And according to the uh, prophets in the book of Daniel, when the prophet Daniel um, tells Nebuchadnezzar Rasha the uh, interpretation of his dream, it's actually, if you look, it's, I believe, chapter 18 of the book of Daniel. Uh, he tells him the, the interpretation, interpretation of the dream. That he had a dream about a statue. The top of the statue was uh, gold, and then the next part was silver, and the next part, I believe, was stone, and the next part was wood, and the wood ended up destroying all the other ones. That was the dream. And he said, How, so what does this mean? So Daniel tells him, listen, this is just what Hashem is telling you, that you're going to be the strongest leader. You got the merit to be the strongest leader that's going to live until Mashiach. No one will ever have control of the world like you until Mashiach comes. You're gold. After him came the Persians and also the Greeks. So, for example, Alexander Mogdon, Alexander the Great... He was the, the second strongest leader after him. And after he died, his kingdom was divided into three kings. No one was able, able to have as much as Alexander. He was the silver. After that, the uh, stone is the next generations. But the last generation before Mashiach is the wood. What's the wood? The wood is representing Ishmael. Ishmael is the, uh, is the, uh, is the Arabs. And it says that in the same dream, he says that Hashem will punish Ishmael more than anyone else. Even though technically when you look at things, he should punish the Christians much more. They cause a lot more suffering to Am Yisrael than, they, uh, than Ishmael ever did. They did it with false beliefs of their idolatry of a false god, which is horrible. The Arabs are judged much worse. Why? 
because they did it in the name of God. To say I'm going to go kill God's children for God's sake is much worse than doing something in the name of craziness, of idolatry, of uh, three gods or 80 gods or whatever gods they have for the week, all these Christians. So this is why the, uh, the prophecy at the end of the times <laughs> is that uh, when all said and done, the punishment to those that stick with the, uh, the, the fanatic type of, of, uh, of Muslim uh, are going to be punished the worst. Um, but unfortunately, until that happens, until that happens, what is that dream telling us? They're part of that statue, meaning they're going to rule. Rule under Muslim, uh, under, 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 under Muslim leadership, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if it's competing with Gainom. And that's unfortunately, this was all like a dream. 1400 years ago when, when uh, the, the Muslim belief was born, no one even thought such a thing. A hundred years ago, no one thought such a thing. 50 years ago, no one thought such a thing. 50 years ago, no one thought such a thing was even possible. What? What these Muslims? What do they have? Camels? What do they have? Now, it's only a matter of time. Now, it's only a matter of time, Hashem Yilachim. And the reason why is because they do Kiruv. If they go out there, like I told you guys in last week's lecture on Wednesday, whoever didn't watch it should watch it. In my opinion, it's probably one of the best lectures we've done in the last year. I usually don't like my own lectures, but this one I actually liked. They do Kiruv. They call Dawa. And Dawa is not like Kiruv that's a uh, undercover. Dawa is in your face. Dawa is happening everywhere. Tzvi Yecheskeli Shichye is a Baal Tshuva journalist. I told you, I think, a couple of stories about him in the past. He, for the last 20 years, has gone into the Arab world. And interviewed terrorists, interviewed different Arab leaders, and so on. Giving Mamash a first eye look of what's happening behind the scenes, behind the CNNs, and all the uh, you know propaganda that's in the world. It's funny, he even said a story one time that before he became religious, one of the people that he interviewed was a terrorist. And the terrorist told him, you know, he was interviewing him. He told him, you know, I really want to kill you now. The terrorist is telling him, the terrorist is, you know, he has the ability to kill him. It's no, but he promised him not to kill him because of the interview. He says, you know, I really want to kill you now. I do, I want to kill, I'm looking at you. And all I can think about is killing you. No matter he's telling, it's like the wolf is telling the sheep. By the way, I could taste, I could taste what you taste like on a barbecue. Pacha de Lokim, you know how scary this is? Guy's telling you, I don't want to kill you. And he really, he's a killer. It's not like he's like saying, oh, I wish you, uh... he, Mamashi, he's a killer, the guy. After he did Shuva, it happened to be that he did an interview with the same guy again. How he came back, he has to have some serious guts, this guy. Anyway, he comes back after he does tshuva. The same terrorist tells him, you know, now I'm obligated to protect you. He says, why? Shava, what, 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 what happened? Why you, you wanted to kill me last week? Now you want to protect me? He goes, no. I wanted to kill you when you were an enemy of God. You were enemy of Allah. I wanted to kill you. Now, you're his chosen son. Now you do what he says, I, I must protect you. Imagine, imagine what kind of Musar a terrorist we can learn from. From a terrorist. What Musar you can learn from a terrorist. Hashem Yechem. 
He's telling you outright, I am the weapon God's using against Am Yisrael. I'm the weapon. So now he did a, I think a year or maybe two years undercover research into the Muslim world all over the place. He went to Mamash. He, he dressed up like a Muslim, got a whole identification as a Muslim, Abu Hamza, as well as a, but real, like a real, not like he just wore a costume, like Mamash, identification, passport, a website, business, everything, like a real, real identification, like like what do you, you see in the movies, but real identification. And he went and inf- infiltrated the Muslim world in Syria, in Turkey, in uh, Germany, in uh, the United States, in France, in Israel. And he went in, and it's all undercover. It's all uh, camera. It's all under tape. It's unbelievable what kind of work he did. First and foremost, I can tell you that America is not what you think it is. Everything in America is free of terrorism, and only once in a while there's some terrorists here. Rabotai, there are terrorist cells everywhere. Everywhere. The naive mentality that there are peaceful Muslims, and most Muslims are peaceful, is naive at best. And the reason why is because even though it starts that way, and many of them are, it's not the majority. There was actually a research done by Prager University all over the world of how many of the Muslims in the world are are willing to die for Sharia law, the, the Sharia law. And how many of them believe in it? And Sharia law pretty much says that we're all doomed. We're talking about percentages that are approaching 80%. In many cases, 90%. So to say that the majority are uh, peaceful is, 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 is a dream, within a dream. Now, in the United States... Because of this freedom of speech that I can say whatever I want to say and they can say whatever they want to say and all these things that we can say whatever we're going to say, this is both the cure and, and a poison at the same time. And that's why there's certain people that are mamash known to be like violent people, like this Farrakhan Rasha, or people like him. Um, these people can literally rule and, and, and lead congregations for decades, without anybody ever touching them. Now, if you tell them, listen, you believe in Sharia law, you want to do it, yeah, what's, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think we believe in? What do you think, we, what else is there to believe in? And you'll see that certain cities, for example, in Michigan, there are certain cities within Michigan that are literally under Muslim rule. Like, you guys, far away from you, because you don't even realize this exists. I didn't even realize this existed. There's actually cities within Michigan that are dominated by Muslims. Dominated Dearborn, by this law. Huh? Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn, Michigan, exactly. Dearborn, Michigan is one of them. And they are planning on going everywhere with this. And they are going everywhere with this. Now, <coughs> as far as if you hear what they say in their, in their mosques, they're not saying, listen, let me give you a shiur about parnasa tova, let me give you shiur about refuah Let me give you shiur about, uh, you know, about how, you know, uh, everything is going to be okay. No, no. They are, their shiurs, one after another, is about how we're going to win the war and make the entire world Muslim. Every one of them, with no exceptions. If you don't, you're not a Muslim. There's no peace. There's no peace. There's, we're going to let you live until you have no choice but to be Muslim. Anyone that thinks otherwise is just too naive to even listen to this shiurim. You should watch somebody else. I can't help you. This is a reality. It's not, it's not, it's not a conspiracy. You go to them. You watch them on YouTube. Watch what they say. They have declared war on the world already for years. But now they say there's two ways to take down the tree. The tree meaning everyone. How? 
One is with the axe, one is with the worm. The axe we tried, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, all of the Rashaim and Rushaim that kill people for fun. It didn't work. They still do it. It's never going to stop. But it's not really working. Why? People still live their life. America is still America. Israel is still Israel. No one's changing because you're killing some people here and there. Okay, it's sad. You're killing here, you're killing there. Sad. But no one's going to become Muslim because you killed his friend. Or you killed somebody they see on the news that's far away in a different town, a different city. No one became religious uh, Muslim because of September 11th. No one's become religious. So what's the second way? It's this, this is their words. The worm. What's the worm? The worm eats the tree from inside. And by the time people realize it ate it, it's already hollow. And they make this analogy for what? Dawa. Dawa is their kiruv, the avdil. It's their kiruv. How? We make the whole world Muslim. How? You go to one of these non-kosher little restaurants or huts or little kiosks. And it happened. It happened to sell halal food. It happened. It happened to sell halal food, which somehow is even cheaper than food everywhere else. So you say, oh, why? It's Middle Eastern, different flavors, sounds delicious. Why not? Who cares? Halal, na halal. I'm going to become Muslim. I just want a sandwich. I just want some rice and some stuff. What do I care for? If somebody doesn't care about, uh, about kosher, I want, I care. It's halal, not halal. It's, it tastes good. It smells good. I want some. You have a few bites. Oh, it's good. You start going every day. Now you'll notice after a while that there's some actually Arabic inscriptions on the halal truck. And on the halal uh, restaurant, and on the halal uh, deli, and on the halal everything. And you'll notice that they're nice to you. Why? Every single time you eat, in them to them in their eyes, like, ah, nice to meet you, my friend. This is Islam. Nice to meet you. You're not realizing it, but I'm making you Muslim right now. You're not realizing it. I'm making you Muslim. And on top of it, your money that you're paying for the sandwich, you think, oh, he's going for the guy's house, for the rent, for the mortgage, for the car. No, no. Halal is predominantly controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. Number one terrorist funding organization on the planet. So now you eat uh, some, some uh, halal sandwich or some halal uh, plate. You think it's delicious, right? You pro- that dollar may have been used to kill a Jew. Oh, how much tshuva we have to do. Oh, how much tshuva we have to do. But why? What's the, why am I telling you all this? Are we going to stop halal? No, it's a multi-billion dollar organization. And it's more than one. It's countless. What's the point? Why am I telling you all this? Why? Because I'm jealous of them. I'll tell you this. I'm telling you all right. I'm jealous of them. Why? They have a nation where even the guy selling food, selling food is doing kiruv. They go to the guy, he tells him, how come, you're, how come uh, you sell food? He goes, all right, so make this what we do, make a living. He goes, okay, but how come you have this um, material for dawah to do kiruv to make people Muslim? He goes, because that's what we do. He goes, oh, so through your job you're doing kiruv? Through your job you do dawah? He goes, no, no, no. It's through dawah I'm, I have a job. Meaning my number one reason for being here is for dawah. It's not for food. It's not to make money. The guy is making 500 bucks a week, a month, or whatever it is. For him, this average Joe, this average Muslim guy, his number one mission in the world is to make you Muslim. I'm jealous of him. Why? He has people that care. That's why there's two billion of them. Because they care. That's why they're winning. That's why they win. It's not because they, they have uh, the, the, the right religion, the right beliefs, the right principles, or the right anything. Only thing they have is they have heart. They believe in their falsehood like it's real. We have the real stuff, but we don't believe in it. Why? You tell somebody to do cure that. Ah, I don't have any time. I'm busy. It's tough. It's uncomfortable. I'm not really sure I should do it. Maybe somebody else. Maybe this. Maybe next week. Maybe next month. This is a botai, a kitrug. A kitrug on us. This is a case against us in Shemaim. It's an embarrassment. It's a shame. It's a shame for 
for us to be in this circumstance. It's a shame for us to be in a circumstance where I have to explain to people and beg them pretty much. One shiur after another in a nice way, a little more aggressive way, and then when people fall off, go back to the nicer way again, and then more aggressive again, and nice again, and more again. Why? Do kiruv, do kiruv, do kiruv. Please, please, do kiruv. Care about your people. Am Yisrael is dying. 94% of them believe it's okay to work on Shabbat. 94% of Am Yisrael believe it's okay to work on Shabbat. It doesn't get worse than that. 34% of American Jews, 34% of American Jews believe in God. The rest, 66%, don't believe in God. Is there something wrong with us that you don't realize how much we need this? What do you want me to start crying to you? Like you don't realize you want the Holocaust to happen again? The next one is the last one. The next one is the last one. There's no more. Gogu Magog, finish. That's it. No, be all calculation. You know what? Let me let me donate eighteen dollars. One chai, one chai. Uh, let me do, do, do eighteen dollars. What's the eighteen dollars gonna do? You can't buy a burger with eighteen dollars. What am I gonna do with eighteen dollars? Okay, that's all you have. That's all you give. But you have to do something else too. Give a CD. Get a lecture. Call five friends. Bring them to the shiur. Four and a half months we have shiur here. No one here has brought one person. Something, do you understand what I'm saying here? You have 20 million people, don't know if God is real. 20 million people. But the Arabs, their hot dog stand is doing Kiruv. The hot dog stand is doing Kiruv. Do you understand what's happening here? They say, Allah, walk by and they believe it. We, we say, Allah, give me panasa, give me money. We pray to God for what? To give us money, more money, more money, more money, more money. We're washed with money. If it rained money, we'd say, Baruch Hashem. We forget about the fact that we actually need the water too. But the Muslims, oh no, the Baruch Hashem, yeah, we have. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, why Allah Akbar? Why, why Allah Akbar? Look, my friend just died for the sake of, uh, for the sake of Allah. But he died, though. You don't feel bad? No, he's died for Allah. I'm jealous of them. Why? They have people that care. They have people that care. That's why they're winning. And that's why we're here in this situation. Forget about just doing kiruv. You try to convince people of the truth. What's so hard about convincing people of the truth? You have to be retarded not to believe the Torah. You have to be much retarded. There's not much to prove. God created the world. A monkey knows God created the world. Only people that don't believe in God are monkeys. Meaning, it's not the monkey itself believes in God. The guy that's trying to be a monkey, he doesn't believe in God. Why? Because he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to believe in God. Why? He doesn't want to have anybody tell him what to do. What's so hard about proving God? What's so hard? Give me five minutes with any person on earth and I'll beat him in a debate. If he's intellectually honest. If he's not intellectually honest, 50 million years it won't be finished. Why? He's a liar. He will never admit to, to losing. There's not much proof to do to prove that God's real. If someone's intellectually honest, five minutes you prove him God's real. If it even gets to that point for five minutes, you have to be on some, some some mental incapacity you have for not to believe in God. What do you think he came from? From nothing? The wall came from nothing? The house came from nothing? The, the, your own beard didn't come from nothing. Even the beard itself that grows for free came from something. Little boogers there in your nose came from something. Wait, they all came from nothing? So it's not so hard, this job, to get people to believe in the Torah. Do what the Torah says. That's the hard job. Do it to us. That's the hard job. Why? Obligates you, limits you, says you can't look everywhere that you're not allowed to look. You can't do whatever you want to do. You can't drink whatever you want to drink. You can't eat whatever you want to. You have to have boundaries. No one likes boundaries. We all want to be dull. Want to be dull is a free bird also, by the way. Dull is a free bird. That's what it means. Not just a dull casuto. <laughs> want to be a free bird. That's what he keeps saying, I guess. That's what he keeps saying, free, 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 in his lectures. Everybody wants to be a free bird. Everybody wants to do whatever they want. Everybody, no, one wants, no one wants any rules. In reality, the most important thing in your life is boundaries. most important thing in your life is the rules. Why? It's going to keep you in check. If you don't have rules, you're going to become an animal. So to prove people God's real, five minutes. 
to prove Judaism is good for you, another one minute. To get people to care, impossible. Why? It's up to you. It's up to you. It's up to you. I'm here with two ear infections, not one, two. Hashem, machmir on me. Give me two ear infections. Enough kaparat avonot today in the last 48 hours to last at least a few months. But we still do a shiur. Why we do a shiur? Because it's pikuach nefesh. The nation's dying, and even the Muslims realize it. That's why they're not fighting us anymore. If they, were, if they really want to fight us, they just, each one of them, they won't even take a, a, a shotgun or a missile or anything. Well, they take like a spoon. Each one will take a spoon, a little spoon you eat cereal with, and they start walking to Eretz Yisrael to take over. Why? Once they get there, they can eat the honey and the milk. The spoon is not to fight with. Why? Two billion of them walking to Eretz Yisrael were finished. But it's not enough for the Eretz Yisrael. They want the whole world. So they say, okay, it's going to take a little longer, another 20 years. Let's have the hot dog stand do kiru, dawa. Let's uh, let the restaurant do dawa. Let's this one do. Everybody does dawa. If you're Muslim, you do dawa. But I'm Israel that has the truth. You have to beg them just to come to the lecture. Do you see what's wrong here? Do you see the, 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 the systemic problem we have here? We don't want to come to the lecture. We don't want to come to the shiu. <coughs> Somebody told me, hey, listen, you, you mind coming to a different country? I said, yeah, sure. You know, I'll come to a different country. If you get a lot of people... You get a lot of people. I'll come. And how many people do you have? People ask me all the time. I want to go here. I want to go here. I want to go. Here. Yeah. If there's a lot of people, you get a lot of people. I'll come. Oh, people. Oh, there's maybe like 30, 40 people. Okay. It's not really. It's not enough. But okay. What else is there? Why do I need to go to a place where there's only going to be 30 people, 40 people? What? There's no one else there. Okay. Maybe they're they're really big donors. Maybe they're really rich. So if I go there. Each person's in a comp with five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars. By the time I leave, it's a few hundred thousand. We funded a book. We funded a project of some kind. So I'm thinking, oh, it's a rich keila, it's a rich congregation or something. It's 30 special people. Okay, so can we advertise, maybe try to get some more people? No, no. The maximum budget we have is a thousand bucks. And it includes the flight, which by the way, the flight alone is eight hundred. The flight alone is eight hundred. Taxi over there, I have to pay on my own. The CDs I have to bring, I have to pay on my own. The TTOT, everything on my own. So what happened? Were they poor? They don't have food to eat? They don't have nothing? No, they... People, mama, you have to, you have to like smash their head against the wall to understand the truth. But to buy a navigation system for $3,000? Where do I sign? Okay, over here, I'll check. Check. Everybody's navigation system. Even though their phone is a navigation system, they still buy the one in the car for $3,000. To get another watch for five thousand dollars that you already have ten at home, sure. What, what, what do you want me to buy a psycho uh, watch for fifteen dollars for that? I have to get a watch, respectable watch, at least five thousand. In my bar mitzvah, I got a fifteen hundred dollar watch for that. What am I to buy a fifteen hundred dollar watch? No, I have to get five thousand, ten thousand. But to go help Ami Slain actually do tshuva, no one has any money, no one has any time, no one has any patience, no one is willing to sacrifice themselves being uncomfortable. You tell the person, listen, do me a favor. Make a few calls. Call your own bit knesset. Call your own bit knesset. Tell them, listen, Rabbi Yaron is coming to do shiu. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure I could do that. Why not? You don't have a phone? I'll lend you my phone. No, uh, I don't know, I'm busy. No, no, not, not during your work. That was after work. Oh, okay, then, yeah, but then maybe the rabbi is busy. You never know. You got to try calling. Oh, yeah, well, if he's not busy and I'm not busy, maybe we could talk, but then maybe he doesn't want to. I said, yeah, that's the point of you calling. Yeah, but what if he says no? I said, then you say yes. Then you say, why not? What kind of rabbi are you? He's teaching to lie, not teaching Christianity. They bring Christian missionaries to Batechnism today. I'm sure they can bring a rabbi too. They bring Christian missionaries to Batechnism. Why not bring a rabbi also that actually does kiru? People do tshuva from him. They bring the, uh, the, the, the people that uh, cause people to sin every five seconds. Why can't you bring somebody that makes people do mitzvot? Why not? Oh, yeah, I spoke to him, and he said he's, he doesn't know who you are. What difference does it make he doesn't know who I am? Go on YouTube, Yaron Ruven. You'll find out who I am. You see me saying anything against the Torah? See me making my own mind? No, he said he's comfortable with people that he knows. Why? The people that he knows are making his kila do tshuva. The people that he knows are keeping the kila exactly where they are. 
20 years they go to Beknezer still driving on Shabbat. But that's it, Rabotai. You know why it keeps being this way? You know why I have to... Because no one cares. It's not the rabbi's fault. He's already in the Tumah. The rat doesn't know he's part of the garbage. He's already lived there for six years. It's the Keilah's fault. It's your fault. It's all of Am Yisrael's fault. Why? No one cares. But if I told you, listen, Rabotai, I'm going to give you sure, but how I made a million dollars in one day on Wall Street. Five million people are going to show up to the shul. Five million. And the other 15 million are going to watch online. Why? That's your moishale. That's your moishale. Your money. Your pocket. 50. On Shabbat. On Shabbat. Ribbono Sholam. On Shabbat. Somebody from the Kila tells me, goes, when are you going to give us a shiur about Bitcoin? Don't you know stuff about it? You know you're on Wall Street for 20 years. I said, I said, yeah, I, I give a shit. He goes, no, not the Musar, not the Musar, just the Bitcoin itself. You're on Wall Street for 20 years. I just want to know about Bitcoin itself. On Shabbat, you're asking me this. On Shabbat, it's a religious person. A religious person, pays and everything. Pays and everything. Why? That's his Moshe Leir. That's our Moshe Le. The Arabs, they believe in their kfirah. They want to put their life on the line. They want to die for it. They want to pray in the middle of the street for it. They want to sell hot dogs in the name of it. They want to go to their mosques in the name of it. 1,300 mosques in, in France don't have enough space for the amount of Muslims that come to pray. 1,300 mosques. Each one can fit 1,000 people. Huge mosques. People have to come an hour before prayer time. To make sure they have a spot. And there's still people praying in the street around it. Al Vayalenu, we can barely get a minyan. We can barely get two minyanim. 20 people, it's like, wow, it's Bibi Knesbia. You guys are doing good. You guys got 30 people. Wow. Amazing. Rabbi must be good. What good? It's 30 people praying. There's 60,000 people living in the vicinity. 30 people praying. This is what we say, good. Busha. Busha ve chirpa. But that's why. You want to know why we're losing? That's why. No one cares. No one cares. No one is willing to sacrifice. No one is willing to make themselves uncomfortable. No one is even willing to do what the guy that's selling the hot dogs is doing every day. Why? It's going to make you uncomfortable. It's going to make you... Uh, e. But if it's money, where do I sign? And that's it, Abutai. I've said my piece. Hopefully it touched some hearts. Hopefully we actually wake up. Hopefully we realize that the Geula is going to come in one or two ways. It's going to come in a nice way, it's going to come in a bad way. But in reality, as far as the Mashiach coming in a nice way, we're out of time. That's not happening. But by Geula, I don't mean that. I don't mean that the Mashiach is going to come in a nice way or in a bad way. Either way, there's going to be a war. Either way, it's going to be disaster. Either way, there's going to be a lot of death, destruction, and so on when the Mashiach comes. There's no question about that, unfortunately. But what I mean by that, Rabutai, is that the Rambam says in Ilkhot Tshuva that before Mashiach comes, there's going to be 15 days of darkness. And at that moment, he's going to kill all of the Rishayim. All of the people that didn't want to do tshuva. Now, who are these Rishayim? Why is it only the murderers, the pedophiles, the, uh, the, the rapists, the Bernie Madoffs of the world? Is it only them? Hey, if it's them, you don't even need to make it dark. Just kill them in the open now. It'll be good for us to watch. What's the, what's, what's the, what's the problem? What's the problem? Why do you have to make it dark for? Even the Goyim are cheering for them to die. The Jews are cheering them for that. Oh, it's the, the rapists, the murderers, what's the problem? 15 days of darkness, Rabotai, because some of these Reshaim are friends of ours, family members of ours. They look like us. They act like us. They pretend to be like us. They're even better than us sometimes. Some of these Reshaim are in positions of power. Some of these Rashaim, you would think they're tzaddikim. 
And the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, page 54, asks, how come Hashem punished the tzedikim, the rabbis, and the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash before he punished the rest of the people? Shouldn't you punish the Rishayim? Chachamim say, the religious people that didn't rebuke the nation, meaning they didn't tell them to go do tshuva, they are the Rishayim. Meaning, you have the truth. You believe in God. You keep Shabbat. You keep Torah. You keep mitzvot. You're not married to a non-Jew. You're doing whatever you need to do to fulfill the will of Hashem. And you don't share that knowledge? You, my friend, are the Rasha. It's not somebody else from far away that's murdering and killing and, and, and everyone knows he has blood coming out of his mouth. No, it's not what we're talking about. What do you think Yom Kippur is just for the murderers and the rapists? Yom Kippur is for all the big Avera. No, it's for the little ones that we don't even know is an Avera. It's that you saw somebody Mechalel Shabbat, you didn't, you didn't say nothing. You saw somebody going against God on a regular basis, you didn't say nothing, you didn't do nothing. You didn't bring him to the shiur, you didn't give him a CD. Why? You were embarrassed. You were embarrassed. The hot dog stand is not embarrassed, but you're embarrassed. You're embarrassed to work for Hashem. To work for some guy for five bucks an hour, you're not embarrassed. For five hundred dollars an hour, you're not embarrassed. To work for a God for infinity, you're embarrassed. Everybody's embarrassed when it comes to God. We're always embarrassed of God. He should be embarrassed of us. But the reality, Rabotai, is that when all of this will happen, when there's going to be this darkness, we're all going to wonder which one of us actually did tshuva. That's what we're all going to wonder. Not about which one of us stopped wasting seed. Okay, but Hashem, you do it. You have to do a lot of a lot of kapat avonot, a lot of different things to, to, to stop doing it and to fulfill the tshuva for it. Great. And keep Shabbat and keep kosher and be kosher and so on. Great. But which one of us is going to survive the 15 days of darkness? That we're not going to know. Why? Which one of us actually helped Am Yisrael? Which one of us sat on our hands waiting for everybody else to do it? Which one was too busy? Who was too busy for God? Too busy for his kids? And who wanted to be Moshe Rabbeinu? Who wanted to be Moshe Rabbeinu? Who wanted to be Moshe Rabbeinu? Everyone wants to be Moshe Rabbeinu after he became Moshe Rabbeinu. What about before? And that's the thing, Rabotai. No one wants to get out of their comfort zone. Everyone is waiting for somebody to hand it to them on a silver platter. Silver platter. No, if it's ready, here you go. If it's ready, I'll take it. If it's not, I'll wait till it's ready. I'll wait until it's ready. And that is a sad situation. Today, we have a warped vision, warped version of what the Torah is, warped version of what Mashiach is, warped for everything is upside down. We believe that we're in this world to enjoy. We believe that Everyone's okay. We even believe that we're okay. And just that feeling alone, that feeling alone is not okay. But you tell people, oh, do tshuva, ah, relax, why are you falling on me right now? It's just too much. You're too strict. And that's sad because we're sleeping. And I'm seeing it as clear as day. If it's not the Christians that are pretending to be Jews by calling themselves Messianic Jews and Jews for Jesus and all types of other garbage that they call themselves and pretending themselves to be Jews, then it's the Muslims that are recruiting on a daily day basis. And if they're not recruiting directly, they're recruiting indirectly. To the hot dog stand, to their uh, different events, and even through dating. Had a somewhat religious guy keeps Shabbat, keeps kosher, keeps basics, does tefillin every day, sent me a message the other day. He's like, listen, I have this uh, girlfriend of mine. She doesn't want to convert, and uh, I don't know what to do. I said, what do you mean she doesn't want to convert, and why do you mean you're religious? What are you talking about? You keep Shabbat. 
goes, no, yeah, I keep Shabbat, I keep this, I keep that, but this girl, she comes from like the same background as me. I'm like, oh, the same background, she's Jewish? She goes, no, no, she's Muslim. I was like, so what's so sim- same about? He goes, oh, we come from the same original country. Said, yeah, same original country, we might as well be a different planet. Muslims and Jews don't get along. It's a reality. As far as our religious beliefs, there, there were, were too far apart. I have some Muslim friends, they're very nice people. But as far as religious beliefs, worlds apart. Worlds apart. That's just the reality. If one, if both people are religious, you can't be friends. One of them, one of the people has to be secular. So I actually have a Muslim friend. He's secular. He doesn't really believe in anything. So we make fun of each other. Twenty years already. But the reality is, Abu Tai, the religious ones, you can't. It's, it's worlds apart. I told him, listen. He's like, can you convince it to convert? I said, I can't. First of all, I can't convince anyone. Second of all, second of all, you should know your life is on the line. Right? He goes, No, no, I don't think, I don't think that her mom is gonna care if she converts. I said, Yeah, her mom may not care, but our dad will. He goes, Oh yeah, yeah, I think he cares a little bit. But no, you don't understand. If his daughter even says the word conversion to Judaism, he'll murder her and you. And if not him, then his brother or his sister or his father or some. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not gonna happen. But we're sleeping. We're trying to like, like trying to like rebuild the wheel. So, I don't know what else to tell you guys, other than tell you that if people don't stop stepping up and doing something about it, I give you Musar lessons until the end of the world. And it's not going to help you. Why? You're not learning the basics of, of, of Judaism. The basis of Judaism is to give. Emulate God. What does God do? He gives. You have the truth and you're not willing to share it? I can't help you. You can watch my shulim from here until next year. It's not going to help you. If you can't learn the basic principle of emulating Hashem by emulating, sharing your beliefs, sharing the truth with the world, and being proud of it, being ecstatic about it, doing it everywhere, never asking any questions, Never caring about who's comfortable and who's uncomfortable. Why? You have something priceless. If he's uncomfortable, he's also retarded. So it doesn't make a difference what he says. If he's uncomfortable, that means there's something wrong with his brain. Who cares what his opinion is then? If someone's uncomfortable with with, with the truth, there's something wrong with them. What do you care about what they think? Oh, yeah, but maybe they're not going to like me anymore. Do you, you care if the wall likes you? It's the same thing. And that's the thing, about that. It's time for us to stop caring so much about they like us, they don't like us, they're going to say, they're not going to say, they're going to do, they're not going to do. Stop. Time to step up. Do what you have to do. Get people to come back to Hashem. Bezat Hashem, something's going to work out. A few more of us are going to be saved. Because the reality is, I learned this chidush recently. The sages in the holy book say that Hashem divided up the suffering of the world to three different generations, to three different places. A third of the suffering of the world went to all of the giants, to the patriarchs, Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, David, Moshe, Aaron, the giants. A third of the world's suffering went to them. That's what made them giants. A third of the world's suffering went to Dore Shmad, the generations of the Holocaust, the pogroms, the inquisitions, the Bet HaMikdash, and so on. And a third, of the world, a third of the suffering went to Mashiach, by himself. And the Gemara in Maseret Sanhedrin, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi asks his friend, Eliyahu ben Levi, when is Mashiach going to come? When's he coming? He says he's here. Everybody always asks, when's Mashiach come? He's here. He's always here. He always has been here. In every generation is a Mashiach. Every generation, one of the seven things that were created before the world was the name of Mashiach, meaning the image, the soul of Mashiach is already here at all times. Part of it is Moshe, part of it is David. Always here. In a Tid Lavo, the Gemara says in the, in, the, in, the, in the future, there's going to be a feast between Eliyahu and Avi, 
Mashiach ben David, Mashiach ben Yosef. But this Mashiach is here all the time. But he's taking all of our suffering. So Yeshua ben Levi says, where is this Mashiach? He says he's in the gate of Rome. Go find him. He's there after they destroyed the Bet HaMikdash in Mach Shemam. He's over there with all the lowly people, injured, Bale Mum, you know, missing body parts, injuries. He goes and sees them, and he sees everybody else is changing their bandages. They take everything off, and then they replace it. But him, he takes one of them off, and then replaces it. Next one off, replace it. Meaning he has infections all over his body. All over his body, he's got infections. He tells how come you how come you're only changing your bandages one at a time? All the suffering you're dealing with. He says, in case they call me right now to be Mashiach. He says, But you said you're gonna be Mashiach now. You told me yesterday, I spoke to you. We came to see him the day before. So you're gonna come. He said, No, I'm gonna come when you do chuva. That's what I meant. When you do chuva, how am I do chuva? You by yourself, it's fine. The rest of the nation. When somebody decides to be Moshe Rabenu, somebody decides to be the prophet Isaiah, when somebody decides to be the prophet Zachariah, when somebody decides to be the prophets, the ones that went out into the nation, the Jeremiah, and told the people the truth even when it cost them their life. We're not even willing to do it when it costs us a few bucks. So that Rabotai is what we have to understand. The Mashiach is enduring our suffering already for generations. The Machshimam, the Christians, have turned this upside down. They made it as if he's the suffering servant is, is, is their J.C. Penny. Just because someone's suffering doesn't make the Mashiach. There's plenty of people suffering. Doesn't mean a Mashiach. But the reality is, is that what this analogy is trying to teach us is that in order for you to be great, you have to endure suffering. Now you, have, you can choose your suffering. You choose your suffering. Every year on Rosh Hashanah, the Gemara says, Hashem decides what to give you. What parnasa to give you. Part of that parnasa is suffering. You're going to have five pounds of suffering, ten pounds of suffering, a thousand pounds of suffering, a million pounds of suffering. Hashem decides how much suffering He's going to give you. You decide how to use it. He says, decreed in Shemaim, hundred thousand pounds of suffering. Hashem Yerachem. Okay, how do you want it? You want to go travel around to different strange places to go do Kirov? Or do you want it in cancer? Or do you want to lose a kid? Or do you want a car accident? Or do you want to lose money? Or do you want to lose some money so you can actually use that money for tshuva? What do you want to do? How do you want that suffering to come? Suffering's coming anyway. Either wake up for minyan in the morning or you are spending half the day in the bathroom. Minya in the morning is tough. You slept a couple of hours less. Half the day in the bathroom, you ruined the whole day. But you got those two hours of sleep. Which suffering do you want? Which suffering do you want? Suffering's coming anyway. Mashiach is saying, he already took a third of the world's suffering. Why? It's the only way you're going to be Kadosh. Get used to suffering. But... The good news is, you can choose it. You can choose which one it is. Sitting there like a golem and crying to yourself, oh, bad things happen to me. We, we, oh, uh, that's not suffering. That's just you being doing nothing with your life. <laughs> You're doing nothing with your life. Your, you, your suffering is being misused. You're already getting the suffering. Instead of crying to yourself, Go use that suffering somewhere else. Go get Amisa to do tshuva. Trust me when I tell you, I'm doing this for four years. It's suffering. You, it looks like fun to give lectures on YouTube and BootTube and NoSmithTube. It's suffering. Trust me when I tell you. It's 100% suffering. Why? All the work that comes with it is very difficult. All the stuff that comes with it is very difficult. But I'd rather have that than be sick in hospitals every month. You have to choose. You have to choose. The salvation, when Mashiach comes, is going to come in two ways. Good way or bad way. Obviously, war is going to happen regardless. What's the good way or bad way? 
Good way is you're going to do tshuva to a shiur like this and actually start taking things seriously and not only start keeping mitzvot yourself, but you start getting other people to keep mitzvot. Bad way is you come to the shiur and do nothing. Or you don't come to the shiur. Nothing's going to change. You're going to stay exactly where they are. Hashem's going to say, oh, okay, you don't want to do tshuva that way? Okay, I'll send you cancer. In the, in the, in the hospice center, everybody's tzaddik. At hospice, when everybody's got five, six, seven days or six, seven hours left, Everybody believes in God. There's no atheist in hospice. When somebody loses a kid, when somebody loses a wife, when somebody loses a father, a husband, or whatever, everybody all of a sudden thinks about God. Why? Somebody they know just went to get see him. So you can decide which one do you want? Which one do you want? You want the nice way or the bad way? Which one? Suffering's coming anyway. That's the truth. Anyone that tells you otherwise is lying to you. Because even the Mashiach has suffering a lot more so at least let's learn let's learn from the tzaddikim let's learn from our torah let's learn from the mashiach let's learn even from the goyim from the from the muslims that are selling hot dogs that are doing kiruv in their hot dog stand to care about the truth at least as much as they care about the lies bezat hashem there's going to be another shiur on Tuesday at the Breslov Center, uh, around nine o'clock, nine nine fifteen, we're always a little late, um, and uh, the Shem will learn. Wednesday there's no shiur uh, this week. Then after that, I'm gonna be off to New York, and uh, the next shiur will probably be one more shiur before I go to California. But the Shem, maybe a Sunday, maybe a Tuesday of the following week after New York. So next week, there's one more shiur left here in, um, I'm sorry, in, in Florida on Tuesday. So the day after tomorrow. Then no shiurs for a little while, for like a week and a half. Then I'll do either shiur here or a shiur in Breslin right before I go to California. Most likely here. Uh, so try to make them. It's going to be shiurs online, obviously. But uh, live is always better. Uh, but hopefully some of you took some things food for thought. Some food for thought, some people that are watching, that have been watching me for a year, two years, three years, and Baruch Hashem doing tshuva, realize that tshuva is not just keeping Shabbat. It's nice, chazak baruch, very good, but there's a lot more to come. There's a lot more to do. So, Zat Hashem, hopefully this helps all of us do tshuva, gives everybody refuah shlema, refuah tenefesh, refuah taguf, and Zat Hashem, I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.